Now on Radio 4, we begin a celebration of Oscar Wilde's life and work, born to be wild, offering a fresh perspective on the making of a modern celebrity. Matthew Bainton and Gemma Jones star in a sparkling new production of the comedy that marked the climax of Wilde's career, The Importance of Being Earnest. The play is introduced by Oscar Wilde himself. <laughs> Your motor running, running. head out on the highway, highway. looking for adventure and whatever comes our way. Like a true nature's child, we were born, born to be wild. We can climb so high. I never was, I never was, I never was to die. I present to you my latest play. Written by a butterfly, for butterflies. It is exquisitely trivial, a delicate bubble of fancy, and has, as its philosophy, that we treat all the trivial things of life seriously and all the serious things of life with sincere and utter triviality. The first act is ingenious, the second beautiful, and the third abominably clever. The Importance of Being Earnest, a trivial comedy for serious people, by yours truly, Oscar Wilde. playing, Lane. I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that, for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately. But I play with wonderful expression. As far as the piano is concerned, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. And speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Bracknell? Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Lane... I see from your book that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed? Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens! Is marriage so demoralising as that? I believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience of it myself up to the present. I have only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. I don't know that I'm much interested in your family life, Ray. No, sir. It is not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Very natural, I'm sure. That'll do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm. Mm. Good afternoon, sir. Mr Ernest Worthing. Thank you, Lane. How are you, my dear Ernest? What brings you up to town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else should bring one, anyway? Eating as usual, I see, Algy. Why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who is coming to tea? Oh, merely Aunt Augusta and Gwendolen. How perfectly delightful. Yes, that is all very well, but I'm afraid Aunt Augusta won't quite approve of your being here. May I ask why? My dear fellow, the way you flirt with Gwendolen is perfectly disgraceful. It is almost as bad as the way Gwendolen flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolen. I have come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you would come up for pleasure. I call that business. How utterly unromantic you are. Please don't oh. touch the cucumber sandwiches. They are ordered specially for Aunt Augusta. But well, you've been eating them all the time. That is quite a different matter. She is my aunt. Have some bread and butter. Mm. I don't think you will ever marry Gwendolen. 
Why on earth do you say that? Well, in the first place, girls never marry the men they flirt with. Girls don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It is a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors that one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? My dear fellow, Gwendolen is my first cousin, and before I allow you to marry her, you will have to clear up the whole question of... Cecily. Cecily? What on earth do you mean? What do you mean, Algy, by Cecily? I, I don't know anyone of the name of Cecily. Lane, bring me that cigarette case Mr Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to say you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you'd have let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one. I happen to be more than usually hard up. There is no good offering a large reward now that the thing is found. Sir? Thank you, Lane. I think that is rather mean of you, Ernest, I must say. However, it makes no matter, for now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Oh, of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It is a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Oh, more than half of modern culture depends on what one should yeah, I'm quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing one should talk of in private. I simply want my cigarette case back. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. This cigarette case is a present from someone of the name of Cecily. And you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily happens to be my aunt. Your aunt? Yes. Charming old lady she is, too. Lives at Tunbridge Wells. Just give it back to me, Algy. Yes, but why does she call herself... Little Cecily, if she is your aunt and lives at Tunbridge Wells. From little Cecily with her fondest love. My dear fellow, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall, some aunts are not tall. That is a matter that surely an aunt may be allowed to decide for herself. For heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case. Yes, but why does your aunt call you her uncle? From little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. There is no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, should call her own nephew her uncle, I can't quite make out. Besides, your name isn't Jack at all. It is Ernest. It isn't Ernest. It's Jack. You have always told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest-looking person I ever saw in my life. It is perfectly absurd you're saying your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here is one of them. Mr Ernest Worthing, B4, The Albany. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being a confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth? earth do you mean by a bumberist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to inform me why you are Ernest in town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. It's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle, from motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admirable governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. But why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you'll be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness... In order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother of the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunburyist. 
You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest, in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury, in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I have been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. You'd much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. <laughs> that is not very pleasant. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. Indeed, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore. So I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do the same with Mr... with your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury, and if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you tonight at Willis's? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate people who are not serious about meals. It is so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon. Dear Algernon, I hope you are behaving very well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. It's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I am always smart. Am I not, Mr Worthing? You are quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. <laughs> I hope I am not that. It would leave no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. <laughs> I'm sorry we are a little late, Algernon, but I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I haven't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looked quite 20 years younger. Now, oh, I'll have a cup of tea. One of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Won't you come and sit here, Gwendolyn? Uh, thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens. Lane? Why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. Uh, there were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Aldermar. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause, I, of course, cannot say. Thank you. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. The fact is, I have just had a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, that I think it is high time that Mr Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. Nor do I in any way approve of modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr Bunbury from me to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen, and if one plays bad music, people don't talk. 
but I'll run over the programme I've drawn out, if you will kindly join me in the next room for a oh, moment. Thank you, Algernon. It's very thoughtful of you. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me? Certainly, Mama. Don't go. Well, clearly Charming day it has been, Miss Fairfax. Uh, pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. And that makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. Well, I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I've ever met. <laughs> Well, since I met you. Yeah. Yes, I, I, am, I am quite well aware of the fact. And I often wish that, in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always held an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr Worthing, in an age of ideals. Mm. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. There is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. Mm. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? <sighs> Passionately. Oh. <laughs> oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. Mm. Mm. You don't really mean to say that you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But but your name is Ernest. Yes. Personally, darling, to speak quite candidly, I, I don't much care about the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you mm. perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music all of its own. Mm. It, 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 it produces vibrations. Well, really, Gwendolyn, I must say, I think there are a lot of other much nicer names. I think... Jack, for instance, is a, is a charming name. Jack? Hmm. Um, hmm? No, there is very little music in the name Jack, hmm? if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I mean, we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. M married, Mr well, Worthing? Well, surely. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Well, may I propose to you now, then? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr Worthing, I think mm. it only fair to tell you, mm. quite frankly, beforehand, mm -hmm. that I am fully determined... To accept you. Oh, Gwendolyn! <laughs> uh, yes, Mr Worthing, what mm -hmm. have you got to say to me? You know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Gwendolyn, will you marry me? <gasps> of course I will, <laughs> darling. How long you have been about it. I am afraid you've had very little experience in how to propose. My own one, I have never loved anyone in the world but you. <laughs> yes, but men often propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does. Mr Worthing, oh. rise, sir, from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Oh, I'm so very, very sorry. No, I'm... Mr Worthing, uh. you must stay where you are. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr Worthing has not quite finished yet. Finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr Worthing, Mama. Pardon me, you are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, pleasant or unpleasant as the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she could be allowed to arrange for herself. Mr Worthing, mm. I require you to call on me tomorrow afternoon. I have a few questions to put to you. Of course, Lady Bracknell, it would give me great pleasure. <laughs> In the, the carriage, Gwendolyn. <laughs> Gwendolyn, oh, the carriage. <laughs> And now, a rendition of a well-known traditional air. Oh, yes, 
I'm the great pretender, pretending I'm doing well. My need is such, I pretend too much. I'm lonely, but no one can tell. can't conceal, my heart can't conceal, oh yes, I'm the great pretender, laughing and gay like a clown, I seem to be what I'm not, you see, I'm wearing my heart like a clown pretending 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 that you are still around Mr. Worthing ma'am you can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name into my notebook, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit, I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? 29. Very good age to be married at. I've always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? Well, I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I'm pleased to hear it. Mm. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal... Unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. Well, they dine with us, or, or come in the evening at any rate. Now, to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Well, who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I'd lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I, I was... Well, I was found. Found? The late Mr Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag, a somewhat large black leather handbag with the handles to it, an ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr James or, or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. 
Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you've just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. May I ask you, then, what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent, of either sex, before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I, I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Good morning, Mr Worthing. Well, I... Good morning. You don't mean to say Gwendolyn refused you? I know it is a way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it most ill-natured of her. Oh, Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. As far as she's concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. Never met such a gorgon. Beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It's the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. You don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Algy? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That is his. Is that clever? It's perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilised life should be. Oh, by the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I'll say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. You would much better say a severe chill. Very well, then. My poor brother Ernest to be carried off suddenly in Paris by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But, but I thought you said that... Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother, Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, that is all right. Cecily is not a silly, romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She's got a capital appetite, goes on long walks and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care. You never do. She's excessively pretty and she's only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh, one doesn't blurt these things out to people. Now, Cecily and Gwendolyn are perfectly certain to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they've called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must hurry. Do you know, it's nearly seven. Oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly let me take your seat for a moment. I have something very particular to say to Mr Worthing. Really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Oh, Algy, you always adopt a strictly <laughs> immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. Kindly turn your back. And, if necessary, please intercept my mamma. Well, really? My own darling. Oh, Ernest, we may never be married. But, although mamma may prevent us from becoming man and wife, <laughs> and I may marry someone else, nothing she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin, as related to me by mamma, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deepest fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Now, your town address mm. at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? Oh, the Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. 
The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. I will communicate with you daily. Oh, my own one. Algy, you may turn round now. Thanks, I've turned round already. Gwendolyn! How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. <laughs> uh, Mama, I believe uh, we are seated over here. No, no, no. What are you smiling about? Mm. Tomorrow, my dear Ernest, I'm going bunburying. Cecily? Cecily! Surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Moulton's duty than yours. Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. Oh dear, Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. I'm not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. I have never met any really wicked person before. I'm afraid he will look just like everyone else. Hmm. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. <laughs> I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so. But it seems very unfair. And uh, was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. <laughs> now, to your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. <laughs> Dr. Chasuble, uh, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well. <laughs> uh, Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I am afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? Uh, we do not expect him until Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He is not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment, as by all accounts that unfortunate young man his brother seems to be. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria, my name is Letitia, Doctor. A, a classical allusion, merely, drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I, I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the woods and back. That would be delightful. <laughs> Um, Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. 
The chapter on the fall of the rupee you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. Oh. Oh. Horrid political economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid German. Mr Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He's brought his luggage with him. His card. Mr Ernest Worthing, before the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother. Did you tell him Mr Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. Mm. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr Ernest Worthing to come here. I suppose you had better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You were under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Uh, oh, I'm not really wicked at all, cousin Cecily. You mustn't think that I am wicked. If you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Oh, of course I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now you mention the subject, I have been very bad in my own small way. Hmm. I don't think you should be so proud of that, though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I can't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack won't be back till Monday afternoon. That is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business appointment. Still, I think you had better wait till Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. About my what? Your emigrating. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Oh, well. The accounts I have received of Australia and the next world are not particularly encouraging. This world is good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That is why I want you to reform me. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I've no time this afternoon. Won't you come in? Thank you. Might I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A Marichal Miel? No, I'd sooner have a pink rose. Why? Because you are like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. <sighs> you are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They are a snare that every sensible man would like to be caught in. Oh. I don't think I would care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. I don't suppose any sensible man would mind. <laughs> and now Miss Cicely Cardew with her own arrangement of a popular romantic ballad. <laughs> For we were just children when we fell in love, not knowing what it was. I will not give you up this time, darling John. Me slow, your heart is all I know, and in your eyes you're holding mine, baby. I'm dancing in the dark with you between my arms, barefoot on the Oh, 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 oh,
are too much alone. Dear Dr. Chasuble, you should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. <laughs> the precept, as well as the practice of the primitive church, was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Rightness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. Whoa! Hey, uh... Mr. Worthing! Mr. Worthing? This is indeed a surprise. We did not look for you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chasuble, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of mourning does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. A more shameful debts and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. Your brother, Ernest, dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Oh, poor Ernest. He had many faults. But it is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? No, he died abroad in Paris, in fact. I had a, a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he reap. Charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the interment take place here? No, he seems to have expressed desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. You would, no doubt, wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion. I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmations, on days of humiliation and festal days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral. Oh, uh, that reminds me, you mentioned christenings. I suppose you know how to christen all right. I mean, of course, you are continually christening, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poorer classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. Hmm. Uh, sh shall we? But is there any particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthy? It is not for any child, dear Doctor. No, the fact is I would like to be christened myself this afternoon if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. No, I don't remember anything about it. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I, I might trot round about five, if that would suit you. Oh, perfectly. Perfectly. Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. Oh, what horrid clothes you've got on. Oh, do go and change them. Cecily! You look as if you had toothache. And I have got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother. Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense. I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out. And you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After he had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think it is perfectly absurd. Here he is. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good heavens. Brother John. I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. <laughs> Uncle Jack, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Mm. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think his coming down here disgraceful. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. 
Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, <sighs> whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Bunbury. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or anything else. I must say that I think that Brother John's coldness to me is peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. Ernest, a word. You young scoundrel, Algy. You must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bumbering here. I put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that's all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I've unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. It is perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying for a whole week with you in your house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for a whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. This bumbering, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. I'm going to go and see what's happened to that dog cart. And I'm going to see what's happened to Miss Cardew. Ah, oh, there you are. Oh, I merely came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's gone to order the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? He's going to send me away. Then have we got to part? I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. The dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope, Cecily, I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I am quite ready for more. <laughs> <clears throat> Cecily, ever since I first looked upon your wonderful and incomparable beauty, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly... Oh. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come round next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy. Of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes. It will be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad, you, of course, have formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism. And, of course... A man who is much talked about is always very attractive. One feels there must be something in him, after all. 
I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. Darling. And when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? Mm -hmm. But my own sweet Cecily, I've never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Oh, do let me read them, Cecily. Oh, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled that even now I can hardly read them without crying a little. Was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. Today I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. Why on earth did you break it off? What had I done? I had done nothing at all. Cecily, I'm very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off. Particularly when the weather was so charming. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. Mm. 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 Oh, I hope your hair curls naturally. Does it? Yes, darling. With a little help from others. I am so glad. Oh. You'll never break off our engagement again, Cecily. Oh, I don't think I could break it off now that I have actually met you. Oh. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, my dear child, do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? But what name? Oh, any name you like. Algernon, for instance. But I don't like the name of Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. It is not at all a bad name. In fact, it is rather an aristocratic name. Half of the chaps who get into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But seriously, Cecily, if my name was Algy, couldn't you love me? I might admire your character. But I fear that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. I must see Dr. Chasuble at once on a most important christening. I mean, on most important business. Oh. I'll be back in no time. And now, let us lend our ears to the honeyed tones and semitones of Miss Letitia Prism. If they ask me, I could write a book about the way you walk and whisper and look. I could write a preface on how we met so the world would never forget. And the sin secret of the plot is just to tell them that I love you a lot. Then the world discovers as my book ends how to make two lovers make two lovers Miss Fairfax, to see Mr. Worthing on very important business. Thank you, Merriman. You may bring us some tea. Pray, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. 
Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me that we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we have known each other such a comparatively short time. <laughs> Pray sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. <laughs> well, then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. Oh, you've never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. You are here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no. I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no. I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh! Why, it is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him. He grows more interesting hourly. I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I have liked you ever since I met you. But I am bound to state that now I know that you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... They do. I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Well, to speak with perfect candour, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than usually plain for your age. Ernest has a strong, upright nature, but even men of the noblest possible moral character are I extremely susceptible... I beg your pardon, Gwendolyn. Did you say Ernest? Uh, yes. <laughs> But it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest never mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say, they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, that accounts for it. Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. And it would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? Of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make a secret of it to you. Our little county newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> My... Darling, Cecily, I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. I have already documented it in my diary. Here. Mm. Mm. Oh, it is... Certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue him at once and with a firm hand. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I entrapped Ernest into an engagement? How oh, dare This is no time for wearing the shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. I am glad to say that I have never seen a spade. It is obvious that our social spheres have been widely different. Shall I tea here as usual, Miss? Yes! Thank you, Merriman. Very good, miss. Are there many?
many interesting walks in the vicinity, Miss Cardew? Oh, yes, a great many. From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Oh, five counties. Well, I don't think I should like that. I hate crowds. Mm, I suppose that is why you live in town. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. Sugar? No, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. Is that so? I am known for the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lengths to which I would not go. From the moment I saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your valuable time. No doubt you have many other calls of a similar character to make in the neighbourhood. Ernest! My own Ernest! Oh, Gwendolyn, darling! At the moment, may I ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? <laughs> Dear little Cecily, of course not. Who could put such an idea into your pretty little head? Oh, thank you. You may now kiss me. <laughs> I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present round your waist is my guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon? This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh! Here is Ernest. My own love. Uh, th a moment, Ernest. May I ask you, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean, to Gwendolyn. Of course not. What could have put such an idea into your pretty little head? Thank you. You may now kiss me. <laughs> yes, I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin, Mr Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? <gasps> Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. No! Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked, but my name certainly is John. It has been John for years. A gross deception has been practised on both of us. My poor, wounded Cecily. My sweet, wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? Uh. Mr Worthing, hmm. there is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Gwendolyn, Cecily, it is very painful for me to be forced to speak the truth. It is the first time in my life that I've ever been reduced to such a painful position, and I am really quite inexperienced in doing anything of the kind. However, I will tell you quite frankly that I have no brother, Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother in my life, and I certainly have not the smallest intention of ever having one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never. Not even of any kind. I am afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No, men are so cowardly, aren't they? Absolutely. This ghastly state of things is what you call bumbering, I suppose. Yes, and a perfectly wonderful bumbery it is. The most wonderful bumbery I've ever had in my life. Well, you've no right whatsoever to bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to Bunbury anywhere one chooses. Every serious Bunburyist knows that. Well, the only small satisfaction I have in the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country quite so often as you used to, dear Algy. And a very good thing, too. Your brother is a little off-colour, isn't he, dear Jack? 
you won't be able to disappear to London quite so frequently as your wicked custom was. And not a bad thing, either. How you can sit there calmly eating muffins when we are in this horrible trouble, I can't make out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. Well, I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The butter would probably get on my cuffs. One should always eat muffins quite calmly. It's the only way to eat them. I say it's perfectly heartless you're eating muffins at all under the circumstances. When I'm in trouble, eating is the only thing that consoles me. At the present moment, I am eating muffins because I am unhappy. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. Well, that is no reason why you should eat them all in that greedy way. I wish it would have tea cake instead. I don't like tea cake. Oh, good heavens! I suppose a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you have just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. <laughs> Algy, I wish to goodness you would go. You can't possibly ask me to go without having some dinner. It's absurd. I never go without my dinner. No one ever does, except vegetarians and people like that. Besides, I have just made arrangements with Dr. Chasuble to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. My dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5.30, and I, naturally, will take the name of Ernest. You have been christened already. Yes, but I've not been christened for years. Algernon, I've already told you to go. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet. And there's still one muffin left. Oh. They are eating muffins. <gasps> they don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It's the only thing to do now. silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we will not be the first to speak. Certainly not. Mr Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have an opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True. In matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Mm. Mr Worthing, what explanation can you offer to me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. Come, Cecily. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr Worthing's. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr Moncrief said. His voice alone inspires one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. True. Oh, I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them the task is not a pleasant one? Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. <laughs> One, two, three. Your, Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our Christian names? Is, is that, that all? But we, we are, are going, going to be christened this afternoon. afternoon. <gasps> For my sake, you are prepared to do this terrible thing. I am. <sighs> to please me, you are ready to face this fearful ordeal. I am. How absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. Where questions of self-sacrifice are concerned, men are infinitely beyond us. We are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Darling. Oh, darling. <coughs> Lady Bracknell. Good heavens. Oh, Gwendolen, what does this mean? Uh, merely that 
I am engaged to be married to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Well, apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by the luggage train. You will clearly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter must cease immediately from this moment. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. I am engaged to be married to Gwendolyn, Lady Bracknell. You are nothing of the kind, sir. And now, as regards Algernon... Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr Bunbury, resides? Oh, no. Bunbury doesn't live here. Bunbury is somewhere else at present. In fact, Bunbury is dead. Dead? When did Mr Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I mean, poor Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Bunbury? Oh, he was quite exploded. Exploded? Was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. My dear Aunt Augusta, I mean he was found out. The doctors found out that Bunbury could not live. That is what I mean. So Bunbury died. He seems to have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. And now that we've finally got rid of this Mr Bunbury, may I ask, Mr Worthing, mm. who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is now holding in what seems to me to be a peculiarly unnecessary manner? That lady is Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I am engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. I beg your pardon. Mr Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. I do not know whether there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air of this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that go on seems to me considerably above the proper average that statistics have laid down for our guidance. Mr Worthing, <laughs> is Miss Cardew at all connected with any of the larger railway stations in London? Until yesterday, I had no idea there were any families or persons whose origin was a terminus. Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr Thomas Cardew of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Gervais Park, Dorking, Surrey, and the Sporran, Fifeshire, NB. Well, that sounds not unsatisfactory. Free addresses always inspire confidence, even in tradesmen. How extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I have also in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles, both the German and English variety. Ah, life crowded with incidents, I see. Though perhaps I'm not too exciting for a young girl. I am not myself in favour of premature experiences. As a matter of form, Mr Worthing, mm. I had better ask you if Miss Cardew has any little fortune. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. £130,000? And in the funds? Miss Cardew seems to me a most attractive young lady now that I look at her. Come over here, dear. Pretty child. Your dress is sadly simple. And your hair seems almost as nature might have left it, but we can soon alter all that. Kindly turn round, sweet child. No, 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 the side view is what I want. Yes, quite as I expected. There are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The, the chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn. They are worn very high just at present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest, dearest, prettiest girl in the whole world. And I don't care tuppence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only people who can't get into it do that. Dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debts to depend upon. But I do not approve of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing that to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. Cecily, you may kiss me. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The marriage, I think, had better take place quite soon. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. 
Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I'm not in favour of long engagements. They give people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I beg your pardon for interrupting you, Lady Bracknell, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian, and she cannot marry without my consent until she comes of age. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may almost say, an ostentatiously eligible young man. Hmm. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very much to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But the fact is that I do not approve at all of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. I fear there can be no possible doubt about the matter. I decline to give my consent. Yeah. How old are you, Miss Cardew? Well, I am really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you again, but it is only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remain 35 for years. Algie... Could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr Worthing, mm. as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait till she is 35, a remark which I am bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature... I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But, my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We've already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr Worthing. As your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church at once. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I am on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance. Is this Miss Prism, a female of a repellent aspect, remotely connected with education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I have been waiting for you there. Prism? <gasps> Come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? <laughs> 28 years ago, Prism... You left Lord Brackle's house, number 104 Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame 
but I do not know. I only wish I did. <laughs> the plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours in a moment of mental abstraction for which I never can forgive myself. I deposited the manuscript in the basilet and placed the baby in the handbag. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. The Brighton Line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, wait for me here. Wait, if you are not too long, I, I will wait here for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Jezebel. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always vulgar and often convincing. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the handbag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes. Here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It has been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. Miss Prism, more is restored to you than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes, mother. Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Hmm? Unmarried? Uh, I do not deny that is a serious blow, but after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another for women? Mother, I forgive you. M Mr. Oh. Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell. I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs Moncrief, hmm? and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algy's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all! I knew I had a brother! I always said I had a brother! <laughs> Cecily, how could you have doubted that I have a brother? <laughs> Dr Chasuble, my unfortunate brother, Miss Prism! My unfortunate brother, <laughs> Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother, Algy. You young scoundrel, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You have never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit. My own. Uh, but hmm? what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Good heavens, I would quite forgotten that point. Aunt Augusta, a moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. Then I was christened! That is settled! Now, what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes, but what was my father's Christian name? cannot at the present moment recall what the general's Christian name was. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we were never even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. Hmm. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. Now, J.K. 
L M M Generals, Mallon, Max Bomb, Magnet. What ghastly names they have. Marks B, Migs B, Mobs, Moncrief. Lieutenant, eighteen forty. Captain, Lieutenant, Colonel, Colonel, General, eighteen sixty nine. Christian names. Ernest John. I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name was Ernest, didn't I? But it is Ernest, after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. <laughs> yes, I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest. My own <laughs> Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Oh, my own one. <laughs> Letitia. Frederick. At last. <laughs> Cecily. At last. Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta, I've now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. In The Importance of Being Earnest, written by yours truly, Oscar Wilde, Algernon was played by Matthew Bainton, and Jack by Abin Galea. Lady Bracknell was Gemma Jones, Gwendolyn, Jeannie Spark, and Cecily, Kerry Goodison. Miss Prism was played by Elizabeth Council, Chorzubal, Sean Murray, Lane, Stephen Hogan, and Merriman was Ryan Early. Oscar Wilde is played by Max Bennett. The songs were arranged and directed by Colin Sell, and the director was Emma Harding. <laughs>